Now the gospel reading for today, the gospel reading was very, very early from the gospel of John. And in this, we can see an icon of the, the re-establishment, the refounding of Israel, that is God's chosen people. Now when God calls disciples, we see something very consistent. Old Testament, New Testament, it's exactly the same in this. When God calls disciples, he doesn't go for the greatest and he doesn't go for the most extraordinary. He instead goes for the plain and makes them extraordinary. And the first line from today's gospel reading is that Jesus is going to Galilee. And there he finds Philip. Galilee didn't have a great reputation in the ancient world. Uh, as, as St. John Chrysostom tells us, it was considered a pretty culture-free zone. The people were uh, boorish and dull. Not, good things don't really come from there. And certainly not prophets. Prophets don't really come from Galilee either. Yet from this backwater, from the smallest and weakest, this is where God works. This is where, God, where God's power is most clearly seen. If he was choosing the best and the brightest, then we could say, look, these people were gifted. But instead, we can see that it was not the humans, but instead the Lord of all. And this is who, uh, who it was that was able to call people, that was able to do such wonders uh, in, in, in these lands. Now, Philip, if we look at the gospel account, Philip was pretty easy to convince. Jesus says, follow me, and Philip goes, all right. And it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. He not only says yes, he goes to his friend and said, look, we found the guy we've been looking for. We found the one that's been promised for thousands of years. And it's this guy from Nazareth. And then uh, Nathaniel's famous response of, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip lacks the words, maybe because Nathaniel wouldn't have heard it anyway, maybe because he's not sure what to say. But he says, come and see. But Nathaniel is, listen, is not just saying nothing good comes out of Nazareth. He's, he knew the scriptures. And this is why he wasn't uh, told off at any point in today's gospel reading. He knew the scriptures. He knew where the Messiah would be from. From Bethlehem. Not from Nazareth. And so when he says, well, none of this can come out of Nazareth, he's showing that he knows the scripture, that he's not going to say what he thinks. <laughs> he's not going to be swayed by his own thoughts, his own emotions, his own feelings, no matter how impactful this guy is. He can't be the Messiah if he's not from Bethlehem. Little did he know, of course, but all he heard was of Nazareth. So later, his knowledge of scripture would be praised. Where... What we hear about Nathanael is, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Behold, a scribe in whom there's no deceit. Not trying to do his own thing. Not using the, the, the lack of copies of scripture that are available. How, how hard it was to read, to find a copy of scriptures, let alone then how, hard it, how rare it was for people to be able to read. All those things together meant that those who could read, well, there was a great temptation there to say not what the text said, not what the prophets of old said, not what holy people have said, but what they themselves said, to try to make themselves the, the go-to source. And this is, this is very unfortunate, but, but Nathaniel was not like this. Nathaniel was one in whom there was no deceit. So we have the uneducated man, Philip, introducing the educated man to Jesus. And Jesus greets him, a true Israelite in whom is no deceit. Nathaniel's never met Jesus. Never met him. And so praise, praise tends to only be as meaningful as the, the quality of the person who's giving it. And so Nathaniel asks for more. How, how do you know this? Why do you say this? While you were under the fig tree, says Jesus, I saw you. When, 
And Nathaniel's response is to acclaim him. That he is a child of God. That he is a true follower of God. The actual words he uses is son of God. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But for now, what he meant was you're a follower of God. And not only that, not only a favoured follower, but also the king of Israel. And Jesus hears him and tells him, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to see all sorts of things. And he says that you're going to see the heavens opened and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This reminds us of another godless man from much earlier, from thousands of years earlier, who, was going, who, who also saw a similar thing. This man called Jacob, who was, who was then called Israel. Just as Israel of old began with a guileless man who wrestled with God and saw the heavens opened with a ladder from earth to heaven and angels going up and coming down. So now this guileless man would not just behold one who is faithful to God, would not just behold one who is the king of Israel, but would behold the promised Messiah, who would behold God made flesh. It's worth comparing this with another acclamation of Christ, with another description of who he is that we find in Scripture. Nathaniel said, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Later, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Two very similar statements. Both called him the Son of God, yet, both, yet each had different responses. Peter was given a blessing because no one revealed this to him, but he knew. And yet Nathaniel was given a corrective. Not only, you, you don't know what, you, what you're saying, there's more to this. The difference is not just in the words that they said, but more so in the meaning that they carried. While Nathaniel calls him son of God, he meant as a favoured human. When Peter calls him son of God, he means God the Son. Not just a favoured human, but who is truly God. Today brings us, we've come to the end of Clean Week. We've experienced Forgiveness Vespers, the nightly compline services, the contrition of the great canon, the frequent and repeated requests for forgiveness. And now we come to today, the Sunday of the triumph of orthodoxy. And this is no triumphalism of orthodoxy. These two are very separate. The unique component in today's service, as we've just experienced, was a prayer service for those who have gone astray. This is no time for triumphalism, but it is a triumph, and we're celebrating a historical event when iconography was restored to the walls of our churches. This is much more than about decorations and aesthetic pleasure. Our iconography is a declaration that, that God became man. It's a triumph of truth over iconoclasm. Today's gospel reading addresses the new Israel, now founded on the rock of our salvation, the experience of our Lord Jesus Christ, who truly did, come, the, the people truly did come and see. They saw an image of Christ, both God and man, just like we today can where they were able to experience the person, we, we are able to see the picture, to see an image of this man, of this God-man. And all those who followed him from ages past through to the present day, with the triumph of orthodoxy, we have the awareness of what is already true, that we see and are seen by our Lord, whether under the fig tree, whether under our roof, whether public or private, there's no distinction, for God, from the highest point to the lowest depth, there he is, as near to us as everywhere else. Where the triumph of orthodoxy, we have an idea of what, it's, of what it means to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So on this day, cherish the icons that you have, the ones that you see around you and the ones that you have at home. They are guides to Christ aids to prayer and as you do 
follow Christ all the way to the end, that we may be with our Lord and with all the saints from ages past that have not been perfected without us. Amen.